Good morning. How are y'all today? What are y'all looking at? This is little Levi Lee this morning. Can you say hello? You know what's funny is that um, we had, have y'all ever, uh, some of you grandparents, have y'all ever watched the kid, watch the grandkids so their parents can get away? Well, uh, his parents uh, live in West Palm Beach, and they were going on a little getaway, leaving on Wednesday this week to go to the mountains, and that didn't work out, right? But I said, well, we got dibs on them, no backs. <laughs> so we just said, that's how it's going to be. Anyway, I guess Rue has to take him from me because I don't think we get much done here this morning. I think I've been going to church every Sunday for 54 years. I think this is the best Sunday I've ever had in my life. Oh, I'll miss you, Bubby. Oh, man, I know it is. Y'all going to have to give me a minute, okay? Well, as Pastor Sean, that's a great time of worship, by the way, Sean. And choir, thank you. As Pastor Sean mentioned, we did the unthinkable. We finished the book of Acts last week, and we, some of you are not going to know what to do without me saying open the Bible to the book of Acts, but we are going to take an Old Testament uh, look today at, at the last book of the Old Testament, uh, the book of Malachi. And um, I was thinking, when you, as you consider what the book of Malachi is like, I was thinking about a few years ago when Mrs. Lee and I were out celebrating our anniversary. We went to spend a few days at Vero Beach. We were at this restaurant that had a view where you could see the water. And it was beautiful. We'd been there a, a few times before to this particular place we like. And one of the, Mrs. Lee has asked me through the years, she said, sit, sit me where I want people watch. <laughs> Because she just kind of gets distracted and looks around and checks everybody out. And I'm like, hello, you got this handsome boy in front of you. Come on. <laughs> anyway, but both of us were distracted this particular night because there was a couple at a table. I don't know. It was a fairly close place. And they were nearby. And we were having the time of our life. Generally, on our anniversary celebration, we'll just talk about, we'll tell our story to each other and talk about how we met and all that fun stuff and the things We've done the things we've treasured together, all that stuff. And we were noticing a couple that was not having such a great night. And it's one of those things where you're uncomfortable, but you can't stop watching at the same time. <laughs> they were barking at each other. They were, uh, I think they'd skipped Sunday school a few times because they were saying some not so nice words <laughs> to each other. And finally, the lady of the couple got up and left and the guy I hope he was paying the bill that night because he he sure had it <laughs> and it was just literally it, we were just drowning in awkward sauce for them and in some ways I think you've been there before where people are near you and they're having a personal conversation between themselves where they're airing grievances with one another and you're just watching and in some ways in some ways, that's how we feel in the book of Malachi, because the Lord has a problem with his people Israel for their behavior, and he uses his prophet Malachi to voice some concerns. Uh, Malachi is sometimes known as the Hebrews Socrates. The Socratic method of teaching was to ask questions. And this book of 57 verses is filled with questions anticipated by the prophet Malachi as to what Israel's thinking in response to some statements of God. And in doing so, you're just listening to a really rough conversation. And it's a conversation where one person is in charge and the other person keeps coming back with really poor responses. Yet there's a lot of hope in the book, because in the book, we learn what God really is after. And we learn to hate what he hates, and we learn to love what he loves. There's a lot of high values mentioned in this brief book. And 
It's a book that sort of troubles uh, commentators in the sense that there's no datable information in the book. It doesn't say when it was written. It doesn't even give us much information personally about who the prophet Malachi is. Based on some clues within the story, the setting seems to be about 100 years after the second Israelite exile. Some of you might have heard that during the Old Testament history, Israel was wiped out twice, once from the north and once from the south, the first by the Assyrians the second by the Babylonians during Daniel's period. And after God's people came back from exile, a man named Nehemiah has come to help rebuild the temple. We know it's after that time because there's a reference to the temple. And this is likely during the time, or Nehemiah rebuilt the wall and Ezra helped rebuild the temple. This is likely during the time where Ezra is ministering as a priest of the Lord. What else is interesting about this book is that it is, well, it's placed for a reason as the last book of the Old Testament. And there's a period between Malachi and the Gospels. Well, it's sometimes referred to as the intertestamental period. It's a season of about 400 years. It's also known as the years of silence from the Lord. Because as far as we have in recorded revelation, God did not speak to his people in a way that we know, in a way that's recorded for 400 years. And so in many ways, Malachi is important for us to learn as followers of Christ because it's kind of God's last attempt to tell his people what he really wants them to get. Have you ever had one last shot to say Something that you wanted to say to someone. Maybe it was a loved one you were saying goodbye to. I remember for me when we had our five sons that graduated high school, were going on to college. I I wrote them what I called the life, dad's life letter. And I wrote two or three pages individual to each kid. I tried to sum up everything I was trying to tell them in the last 18 years. And I said, in order to get your graduation present, you have to read this and let me know that you... (laughs) A little, little dad manipulation, I guess, there at the end. But I was desperate to say, hey, have I told them everything I could tell them? And this reminds me of God's last-ditch effort for him to share what was really on his heart. Today, we're going to talk about verses 1 through 5, and we're talking about approaching God's mysteries. Um. God, of course, is on a different level than we are in terms of his, well, in terms of everything, right? But in terms of his understanding, in terms of his knowledge, and in terms of his perfection and character and everything. And so, in light of that, we have to live with some mystery. And for some of you, that's just fine. Maybe some of you can watch a mystery show or read a mystery novel And you are as calm as can be. But some of you can't handle waiting to the end. You're either going to fast forward or you're going to go to the end of the book because you've got to figure out how how the story ends. Or maybe the whole time you're not doing it that way, but you're guessing and sensing. And you just can't put it down until you've figured it out. Depending on how you are wired and what your sort of natural curiosity level is, some of us have a harder time with the idea of mystery. And mystery shouldn't trouble us as worshipers of God because it's just a reminder of the vast difference of how his ways are higher than our ways. Matter of fact, there's something comforting about mystery when it comes to God because we know enough about him to trust him. He's certainly done enough to merit our confidence. At the end of the day, there should be a sort of a a confidence that comes of, you know what, God is not able to be fully figured out, and I am okay with that. That's the kind of God I want to worship, not someone that I can plumb the depths of who he is. And so there's a sense where we have to learn to live with a little tension of the mystery of God. Well, let's begin here by looking at this wonderful book. First of all, in verse 1, it says, The oracle of the Lord 
to Israel by Malachi. So the word oracle there is a word that also is translated burden. And so in other words, when you hear a prophet use the phrase the oracles of God, this is a substantive teaching. And we're in a day where, well, I wouldn't say that our culture and our generation is given to deep thought. We are posting our desserts on the internet so everybody can see what we had for dinner. (laughs) We're a people that scrap about everything from the weighty to the inordinately insignificant. And so when we have to deal with weighty matters, sometimes our, our brain is overloaded with fluff and we're not used to thinking deeply about wonderful things. And Malachi challenges us with that. Notice he says, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel... That's God's chosen people that the the story of the Bible is certainly about. And then it says, by Malachi. Have you ever asked the question, who wrote the Bible? And then someone says to you, well, that's silly. God wrote the Bible. And you're like, okay, that's cool. How does does God write a lot of books? Because I'd like to get in on that. Is it true that God wrote the Bible? Well, I believe it's absolutely true that God wrote the Bible. But right here in verse 1, we notice there's dual authorship. That God moved in the hearts of prophets, divinely inspired writers, Old Testament and New, to record exactly what God wanted to be said. But he used his flawed servants to be his mouthpiece and instrument. So... Let's not under, underplay the role of people that God used to write the Bible. There's a dual authorship with God being the primary. Now, you're going to easily sense that God's frustrated with the behavior of his people after they turn from exile. What was the exile about? Well, after all God done for his people, they couldn't seem to quit worshiping idols. They couldn't seem to quit turning to other nations for help. God said, hey, it's going to cost you. Cost them enough where they were lost as a nation. And and, then the last exile is from some 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. And you can imagine as they're coming back into their lands that there's people that were old enough to remember or people that at least heard about it from parents and grandparents that, hey, This time, we're going to go back in and we're going to worship the one true God alone. We're going to give him our all because bad things happen when you disobey the one true God, apparently. You lose your land. You lose everything. But you're going to get the sense that they've kind of gone back to their own ways of idol worship and especially false worship in the house of the Lord. But I'm so touched by the first thing that God says in verse 2. What comes out of your mouth when you're really frustrated with someone that you care about and that you want to sort of mend things up with? Unfortunately, there's kind of a a sewage spill that comes out of our mouth with frustration. But not not the one true God, not the loving God that we know. The very first thing he says in verse 2. I'm just going to read the first seven words of verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord. What an incredible thing to hear to a God who is displeased with the behavior of his people and wanting them to change and return to him. The very first thing he said is, I have loved you. And there's, um, as many of you know, we have a Christian rehabilitation ministry for drugs and alcohol downtown. And these men and women that come there, they don't know how much they can get into our hearts. Mrs. Lee and I spend a lot of nights going, hey, how do you think so-and-so is doing? I hope they're doing okay. They're always on our hearts and minds. And part of sometimes the process of becoming free from alcohol and drugs is there's some relapse involved. And I didn't understand that when I first got here. I'm like, hey, I thought you were done using drugs. Why you said you were going to quit? What happened? But I've just kind of learned a little bit how it rolls. And if I know the person well who has relapsed and started using again and I can either contact them and reach out to them. The first thing I try to say to them is, hey, listen to me. Do not forget 
how much God loves you. And do not forget how much we love you. Am I feeling something else? Do I want to offer a slap offering on them in the name of the Lord? (laughs) Yes. But I ask God to open up my mouth and give me his love. I love you. And the living God, the one true God, deeply loves you. Man, God's love is incredible. The first principle on your outline this morning as we talk about approaching God's mysteries is number one, accept the fact of God's love. Does there sound like God stuttering in the first part of verse two? I have loved you. Does it sound like he is iffy on that? No, he is stating something that is a fact that can be backed up by proof. There are several things about God's love I want to remind us of this morning. First of all, God, God love, loves us in spite of our sinfulness. This is a people that are very difficult to love. Some of you have noticed that I am sort of partial to Mrs. Lee. And if I were you, I would not be too impressed at how much I love her. Do you know why? She is the easiest person in the world to love. If I'm lying, I'm dying. The most lovable thing on two feet. And I have flipped over her for a long, long time. What we should be impressed with is friends and family that you know that deeply love somebody that is super hard to love. You know that person that you love or you've seen others love and all they do is mock your love. All they do is disrespect your love. All they do is throw away your love. And some of you know what that's like. And the worse you're treated, the more you cling to Christ and the more you just pour out some kind of stunning love for them that did not come from you. That's the kind of people that I'm blown away with. That's the kind of person I want to be. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this morning, that's agape love. That's a Greek word that talks about the divine love of God. That's the kind of love we see here. This is not a sweet bunch of lovable, wonderful, amazing, smiley, obedient people. No. These are people that are done with God. And he loves them despite their sinfulness. You know, God's love is often his method for repentance. Maybe you've read the book of Romans, and in verse 4 of chapter 2, it says that God's kindness leads us to repentance. It's not a bad word for those of you who are parents out there, because sometimes we want to get our children to repent with harshness. And I'm not saying there's not a time and place for well-timed firmness, but I am saying that what motivates us to repent is God's kindness. God's kindness leads us to repentance, and that's a beautiful trait of the love of God. God's love is also not based on sentiment. It's not based on how you feel. I've had the privilege of doing a lot of weddings. You all may have been to many weddings. I have never done one or been to one where the vows sound something like this. Do you promise to have butterflies in your stomach at all times? Do you promise to write cute little notes to each other? Do you promise to have sort of honeymoon vibes all the time? And do you promise to always be just floating on the clouds together? That's a no. (laughs) But as love, well, why, why is that not in a wedding? Because it's based on a covenant on a binding agreement between two people and the living God that is not based on behavior. It's not based on how I feel at the moment. And thank God that his love toward us is not based on how he feels. Because he does feel, as we'll see in this passage and other times in this book, he does have emotion. And one of the emotions is anger. And thank God that his love doesn't ebb and flow when his sentiments aren't the same. 
you and I must learn to have a deep, mature, covenant-type love that chooses to love when we are hurt, that chooses to love when we are wronged, because that's how God loves us. God's love is also abounding. There are several verses that, like, one of them is Psalm chapter 103, verse 8, that describes God as abounding in love. You know, have you all ever noticed that the government is not necessarily great with economics? Anybody ever picked up on that? (laughs) This whole, hey, we're having a rough economy, let's print a bunch of money that's backed up by nothing. Cute little paper that says that this is a 5, 10, and a 20, and a 50 that's really not worth anything. But they are assuming that there's something behind that paper to back it up. But I want you to know that when God ha- says that he loves us, it is backed up by the treasury of his golden love that never runs out. It comes from a heart that is filled with love that flows like a river from the mountain of the God for the one true God to people like us. And it never runs dry and it never runs out because it is abounding. But something else about the love of God is that it should lead us to have a God-centered mentality. How do you respond when someone says to you, I love you? Man, if, if Mrs. Lee looks me in the eye and says, sweet man, I love you, I don't walk away going, I am some kind of awesome. Man, I must be incredible. I am amazing. Now, to be sure, when God expresses the fact of his love and says, I have loved you, it should affect the way you feel. It should form the core of your identity. And you should feel loved, to be sure. But it shouldn't lead you to walk around enamored, with your own awesomeness and for you to be caught up in your amazingness. That's, I think, the shallowness of even sometimes the Christian understanding of God's love. It should lead us to be white, hot worshipers that are enamored with the person of God. God, you love me? Do you know me very well? I am in awe of you that you would ever say that you love me, that you would ever show that you love me. Brothers and sisters, we must accept the fact of God's love. The second principle also comes from verse 2, and it's simply this. Resist pushing back to obvious truth. Now, I mentioned that there's a lot of questions asked by Malachi as if he's heard them from God's people. And I don't want anyone to think that if you do it the right way, it's technically wrong to ask questions of the Lord. There are many people that ask questions of God in the Bible. Sometimes they ask them poorly and are reprimanded for doing so. Even when they're asked in frustration, it doesn't mean that that's how we're supposed to act. It just means when you feel that way, that's what you should do. I think we should should always ask questions of God carefully. So don't have the takeaway being, okay, all right, I'm just never going to ask a question of God. That's not the point. But what you'll see here, this is not the way to ask questions of him. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? How have you loved us? You know there's a problem when you say to somebody, I love you. And they look at you and say, yeah, right. I still remember the moment in 1991 where I was in Mrs. McCurdy's apartment at that time. And I finally got the moxie up to say. And I said it so subtly that I wasn't sure if she heard me because I wasn't sure what all it meant. But I just, we were back there, we were working on dinner together. I'm a 21-year-old college student. She had just finished college. And I, and I said, you know, um, <clears throat> I love you. She's like, you're not getting away with that. What, what, what did you say? I love you. 
And imagine if she looks at me and says, that is hilarious. <laughs> that is funny if you were serious. No, no, no. <laughs> That's the ultimate slap, isn't it? You love me? Yeah, right. Well, you, mister, have a funny way of showing it. And that's exactly the vibe you read here. I have loved you. But you say, how have you loved us? And they're pushing back to an obvious truth that couldn't be any truer. The fact that they're still breathing in and out. God, it would have been much easier for God just to go, wham! And he's wiping them out like he wiped out the Assyrian army in the book of Isaiah. 185,000 people slain just like that. That would have been a lot easier way to deal with uppity, ornery people. But no, God loved them and so he disciplined them. And they're saying, you love us, God? What about those last 70 years in Babylon? What about these conditions back here in our homeland? I'm not feeling the love. And I, hey, let's, we know that's not the right move, but let's just be honest, sometimes we're tempted to feel that way. I think the two reasons why we're tempted to not believe that God loves us is, first one is that we have a difficult time trusting that he's forgiven us for our past sins. And just imagine all the sinning in this room that we've all done. Matter of fact, let's don't do that. I'll take that back. I'm just saying, there's a bunch of things we've thought, said, and done that dishonor the Lord. And a lot of times, our eyes are glued on our past. Sometimes our psyches are different in how we respond to the emotion of guilt. And sometimes we are so glued on our failure that we can't ever trust that anyone would forgive us. We read it, we hear about it, but we can't move past it. I heard a beautiful testimony this week from one of our new men's mission graduates. And he had been basically a meth addict for 35 years. It's shocking that he's still alive. He moved into our center six months ago from living in a tent in a nearby town. And all he did all day was go find meth and alcohol, pounding himself unto his death. But he heard about our program from a graduate who lived near there in in Winter Garden brought him to our program, and I, you wouldn't believe the difference in this man's life. I would call him a young man. I guess he's young in, in, in Lake County. He's my age, but he's sitting there. He is just, yeah, don't take that in the best way possible, by the way. <laughs> All that to say, I'm sitting there listening to his story, and I'm in awe of how much he is, loves God now. And I said, Jason, was it hard for you? to trust God for all the things you've done through the years. And he says, it was hard on me at first, but then I just began to realize how much he loved me. And I began just, just to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to leave it there with him. And sometimes our pride gets in the way because we're so mad at our own failures. And we, we, I can't believe I said this. I can't believe I did this. I'll never forgive myself. That whole forgiving yourself thing is not in Scripture, by the way. Do you stand or fall? Are you going to stand before yourself one day? I know what we mean when we say, I can't forgive myself, but it's better to say it like it really is, and that's this, I don't trust God enough to believe he forgives me. Do you have the moxie to say that? If you do, you'll probably get along better if you really say it that way and say, Lord, help me trust your love. But the second reason we have a hard time believing God gives us is because many times our circumstances don't seem as though he loves us. And we become people like verse 2, God's people that say, oh, I, yeah, how have you loved us? How was, how, by the way, how was your wine this week? I do mean wine with an H, by the way. Some of you were going, wait a minute, this sermon's getting good. <laughs> but isn't it amazing how a couple of days without power for some, a little debris on the ground, A little 20-minute wait at the gas station leads us to the most ridiculous conclusions that our life is that difficult. And sometimes if you get enough of that and you throw in an illness, you throw in a loss, you throw in a ruptured relationship, you throw in a financial challenge, and our hands are up saying, God, you love me still, right? 
Do something. And have we forgotten that we often exist in a tunnel where we can't see the other side yet? And that if we know anything about God, it's that the fallen world we live in has a whole lot of difficulty that God is working into our good like he did with Job, like he did with Joseph, like he did with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've got to quit pushing back on an obvious truth when God's love is often displayed through the difficult times of our life at the golden lessons he teaches us. The third principle this morning about approaching God's mysteries is number three, and that's this, savor the wonder of God's choosing. Savor the wonder of God's choosing. At the end of verse two, it says, yet I have loved Jacob... In verse 3, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to the jackals of the desert. So he describes the Edomites that their country at this time was run by wild dogs in the desert. And he makes a statement that Paul picks up on in Romans 9 to describe God's national election of the people of Israel and how that applies to Gentiles who come by faith to Christ and are grafted in to a relationship with God. And he mentions very clearly that it's an act of God's electing love. Now, the first part at the end of verse 2, I have loved Jacob. This is, of course, a reference to God's people Israel. And We read in places like Deuteronomy 7, verse 7 and 8, I did not choose you because you were numerous than all of the nations. And I didn't choose you because of your behavior. He says in verse 8, it was because I loved you that I chose you. It wasn't a eeny, meeny, miny, mo, Edomites, Canaanites, Israelites. I don't know. I guess I'll pick Israelites. No, God had deep love as he chose his people. And someone asked the the late British preacher preacher Charles Spurgeon said, I have a problem. I don't understand why God would hate Esau. And Spurgeon said, ma'am, that's not my issue. I have a harder time knowing why God would love Jacob. This is a shocking verse. And it was God's not capricious, not coin flipping kind of random love, but it was God's set affection for reasons known to himself that he put his choice upon the nation of Israel. And that is applied to us in the book of Romans, that that's how we come to know God, by his active work. Now, that next phrase, but Esau I have hated. Now we are, some of you are going, how did this make the cut in the Bible? But Esau I have hated. This goes against our sensibilities. It goes against point number one on your outline about God's love. How does he hate someone? And I don't want to lessen the force of Scripture ever. I don't want to try to, that's what people do a lot of times. If there's something uncomfortable, they do their best to talk to, well, it doesn't really mean that. What it really means is this and this and everything's fine. Just do what you want to do. I'm not trying to lessen the force of this word, but I think it's important that we see that sometimes the word hate is a Hebrew and sometimes Greek idiom to show that it means that God loves less or God passed over. God chose this person and did not choose this person. So in comparison to his love, it feels as though it is hatred. God doesn't hate anyone in the way that we use the word hate. And how many times did you use the word hate yesterday? You may have hated to see the Gators lose in overtime to the volunteers. And you said it yourself. But when we really hate something or someone, we usually have a, a disgust and a desire for revenge or desire for inflicting some kind of wrongdoing against this person that has wronged us or gotten under our skin. That's what we mean by hate, the feeling of great repulsive disgust. And that is not what it means in this verse. God is very much in control of his emotions and only acts when it's appropriate and according when his righteousness has been offended. 
But sometimes the word hate is an idiom. Jesus himself used it. Have you ever scratched your head in reading Luke chapter 14, verse 26, when Jesus had the audacity to say, unless you hate your brother, father, and mother, you cannot be my disciple. Do you remember that verse in Luke 14, 26? And he's using the idiom saying, meaning that our love for Christ must be so great that compared to any and every relationship, it is so different that it almost seems as though it is hate. And so this is basically a striking contrast. Now, you might say, well, what does this mean for us then? What's the takeaway? Why did Paul use it in Romans 9? I think it's a reminder that salvation is ultimately a work of God. Now, to be clear, to be clear, in order to receive salvation, we have to make a real response. We have to make a response of repentance and faith as we saw all throughout the book of Acts. The question is not do we make a response. The question is what is the origin of that response? Does it flow from something we can pull off in our own ingenuity? Or is it something that God grants to his people? And it's genuine because it's based on desire, our desire. Matter of fact, in this very passage in Romans 9, Paul says in verse 16 that it is not based on man's will, desire, or effort, but on God's mercy. Yes, we must believe, but the belief stems from God. If you've ever desired to repent of your sins and believe in Christ, I want you to know that that desire was given to you by the one true God. Yes, it was real because you wanted it, but it didn't come because you're a smarter, better, and more spiritual person than the other. Paul also says about our, our hearts apart from Christ, in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, that the sinful mind is hostile to God. It cannot submit to God's law, nor will it do so. We can't do it in our own strength. We have to be enabled. That's why Jesus said in John 6, 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will never drive away those who come to me. In other words, it initiates from God. But anybody and everybody that wants to come to Christ can come to Christ because their willing came from God. And so that's why we preach the gospel to everybody. That's why we ask everybody to repent. And those who repent, those who come to Christ are empowered by God to have a real desire to choose him. Some might say there's something about this that doesn't seem fair. And I would say this. It's only unfair if God owed us something. Has someone ever owed you something and it wasn't fair that they didn't bring it back or repay? Sorry to ruin your mood this morning by that analogy. <laughs> but when we say, hey, that's not fair that they didn't pay me what was owed me, it's because they owed you something. Think for a moment, what does God owe us, the one who made us? I would say, brothers and sisters, God can operate the world however he wants because we are owed nothing by his sovereign hand. But the purpose behind his electing love is assurance. Note the asterisk on number three. God's decision to love us fills us with assurance. His decision to love us fills us with that he's trying to reassure his people. Oh, you don't think I love you, do you? Well, note this. How did you become my people? It's because I chose you. It's because I love you that I chose you. Hold your head high. Be assured of my love. The last couple of verses we'll look at, four and five. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down, and they will be called the wicked country, and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Man, that's intense. And this represents people that reject God. Notice this, it said about God, he is angry forever with people that reject him. What does it mean for God to be angry forever? Is God angry at me, you might sometimes ask. Well, once again, God's hate is not the same as our hate. God's anger is not the same as our anger. When we are angry, it's because our desires and goals have been blocked and we want to lash out. Well, the God, when he 
experiences anger toward us, it's because his holiness has been violated and he acts not in unrestrained measures. He acts with righteous restraint. That's why anger is so unbecoming for us. That's why James said in James 1.20, human anger, human anger, not God's anger, human anger does not bring about the righteous life that God requires. And so, yes, God is angry when we don't come to him. But if you are his, you've been covered by the blood of Christ and God is displeased with our sin, but he is not angry at us. So don't ever have to ask the question if you are God's child, if you know him, is God mad at me? Is God angry at me? He might be very displeased, but his anger has been averted by the love and the blood of Christ. The last verse this morning, your own eyes shall see this and you shall say, Great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. There's a similar verse to this next week in verse 11 that we'll unpack a little bit deeper. But one of the goals of the Bible, one of the goals of the book of Malachi is for God's people to see that, yes, you are my particular people, you're my people, but it doesn't mean that I'm your own tribal deity just for you. You're to take me as my people to the people that aren't my people yet. And if you do that, you will see great is the Lord beyond the borders of Israel, beyond the borders of the United States, beyond the borders of Christian America. We are grateful for God, but we don't keep him to ourselves. He will not become our little God just for us, like a personal God, like a personal pan pizza that no one else can have a slice of. No, we want everyone to know the one true God, and he will be great among the nations. How do we summarize those two verses? Number four in your outline, and that's this. Never forget God's severity. We saw his love in verse two, and we see his severity in verse four and five, and they are not opposed to one another. He doesn't have a flimsy, weak love that looks at sin and says, ah, no big deal. That's fine. You can offend my holiness and it's no big deal. No, 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 no. God's too great for that. And so we can't forget his severity. But his severity is not directed toward people that are his in an ultimate and especially an eternal way. That's why this morning it's vital for you as we come to the end of this message. Some of you are going, I'm kind of glad we came to the end of this message. I kind of miss me some acts right now, okay? (laughs) Well, we have come to the end of today's message. But the heavy stuff, you had to bring your thinking cap today, didn't you? But the heavy stuff we just heard about demands a response from us. And maybe you're watching online or maybe you're here in the room. Have you ever come to the place in your life where you've personally trusted in Christ to receive his gift of forgiveness? You'll see in a moment a number on the screen that we love to get with you later this week to talk about it. But there may be some here today that when the service is over, some of our pastors will be here ready to pray and talk with you. And I'd like us to bow together for a word of prayer right now. Lord, I... The thing that you wanted your people to know is that you have loved them. And what a stunning way you have proven your love when you said, but God demonstrates his own love for us. And this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Lord, as you demonstrated your love to us on the cross, help us receive it and believe it today. Father, overcome the resistance of any heart that's running from you here today. Father, we are burdened for people in our area that are struggling with trees on their roof and maybe some unwelcome water coming in their house, and we pray they would look to you. We're really concerned for those south of us that are, their lives won't be normal for a long time. We pray that as the gospel goes to them in the form of human care and sometimes in a gospel witness, that there'd be an openness and a wonderful turning to you. And may our country see the severity of the storm and realize that they're There's a severe God who also loves them. Bring about as we're in a time of upheaval in our country with this big election company coming, we'd like to pray that God's people would stick out as lights and beacons and you'd bring a great spiritual awakening in our day. 
but may it happen right now in our midst as you draw people to your truth in the only name, the mighty name, Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.